Thank you for downloading this Council on Foreign Relations video. CFR is an independent national membership organization and nonpartisan research center. For more information, please visit us online at CFR.org. This meeting is on the record. We are also joined by some council uh, members from New York. They will not be able to ask questions, but they're able to hear uh, the proceedings. The Prime Minister will make some introductory remarks, and then he and I will begin our conversation, and then we will open it up to uh, questions from all of you. And I've been asked to say after we conclude that we're all to stay in our seats until the Prime Minister leaves, and that's a desire of the Secret Service. So Morgan Changer, I think, needs no introduction to this audience, uh, but a longtime opposition leader in Zimbabwe, head of the Movement for Democratic Change Party. He ran for president last year against strongman President Robert Mugabe in a and in a process that was widely seen as fraudulent. He uh, failed to win decisively enough in the first round to avoid a runoff. Uh, he did drop out of the second round after state-sanctioned attacks on many of his supporters, some of whom were killed. Then this past February, he, got, uh, he joined a coalition government. He entered into a power-sharing arrangement with President Mugabe, and together now they are trying to govern a country that, uh, where the inflation rate was multiplying, literally doubling or tripling overnight, where food and fuel and medical supplies and, and assistance had virtually vanished. This week, he's in the United States as part of a three-week tour of Western capitals in an effort to persuade Western donors and governments to re-engage with Zimbabwe, perhaps lift some sanctions, and extend aid. His visit to the Council today is his first public event here in the States. And Prime Minister Changre, welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Margaret, <coughs> and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It is a pleasure to be here at the Council of Foreign Relations. <coughs> you provide great opportunities for speakers like me to address these kinds of forums. <coughs> I'm here today to say thank you to America from the people of Zimbabwe. Your humanitarian aid, which as we speak has saved the millions of Zimbabweans. Thank you for your support, for our struggle for democracy, a struggle that continues today. <clears throat> from, from your very foundation, you stand upon the idea that all men, all men everywhere are created equal. That revolutionary ideal echoed throughout your history, through Abraham Lincoln, who looked for a day that the weight would be lifted off the shoulders of all men, and all would have a chance. And President Barack Obama, just last week, telling an audience in Cairo that the people of America is the hope of all humanity. So, as you provide emergency food and medical assistance to the people of Zimbabwe, you also shine the light of hope to us, and indeed to all the dark places of the globe. I first came to America 20 years ago as a young union leader. I had the good fortune to be selected for the International Visitors Program. I spent four weeks here visiting all across the country from New York to Wyoming to California. And I saw your nation from sea to shining sea. This was an eye-opening experience, as you can imagine, for a young man who had gone down in the mines in 1974. But one thing struck me that may surprise you. I was struck by how much the people of America reminded me of the people of Zimbabwe. Mining, even in the best of circumstances, is a hard and dangerous work 
And most who do it learn to be judges of the character of those around us. And what I saw in American people is also what I saw and see in the people of Zimbabwe. <clears throat> Zimbabweans, like Americans, are hardworking people, people who persevere in hard times, and people with, I am told, the American word is gumption. The independent Zimbabwe I knew as a union leader was the best country in Africa. We were a nation of different tribes, but without tribal differences. We were a place where people of different backgrounds came together working on our farms, on our mines, making them the very envy of our continent. Our school system became the best in Africa, and we had a good health care, and our life expectancy rivaled that of nations in the global north. In the last 10 years, all that has been destroyed. 10 years ago, we were the second largest economy in our region, behind only South Africa. Now we are the smallest behind even tiny nations of Swaziland and Lesotho. The often unhappy 20th century saw too many countries devastated by war, and too many governments which intentionally persecuted portions of their own people. Despite the dawn of this new hopeful century, Zimbabwe stands as a remarkable testimony of the power of a corrupt government in pursuit of selfish policies to impoverish an entire nation. <clears throat> the problem was evident to most Zimbabweans by mid-1990s. In 1999, from my post as Secretary General of the Zimbabwe Congress of Trade Unions, I called a National Working People's Convention, which led to the organization for the Movement for Democratic Change, as a direct response to the people's dissatisfaction with the current political dispensation. In the year 2000, President Mugabe, in an attempt to circumvent a new people's constitution, orchestrated one of his own, which would have increased his own powers, while diminishing those of the people. To prevent this travesty, I joined other church and civil society, human rights and labor leaders in the National Constitutional Assembly to campaign against the imposition of this sham constitution. In a national referendum, it was rejected by the majority of Zimbabweans. The last election in Zimbabwe that outside observers have labeled free and fair. Sadly, rejection of government at the polls did not lead to democratic change that people wanted. In a series of elections since then, marred by violence and voting irregularities, the results announced by the ruling party in each case left the democratic opposition just short of votes needed to take power. At the end of 2008, African leaders mainly genuinely concerned about democracy and others who could no longer ignore the Zimbabweans dying on their streets brought about a negotiated settlement which resulted in my becoming Prime Minister of Zimbabwe. The leaders of our party, the Movement for Democratic Change, agreed to that negotiated settlement very reluctantly. Many of us had been tortured by the regime with which we were to form this new government. All of us had, been, had seen friends and supporters killed. In the weeks leading up to this negotiated settlement, President Mugabe began a campaign to force out the humanitarian agencies which were the only source of sustenance and medical support for the majority of Zimbabweans. To walk away from the negotiating table would have been to watch as many as four million people starve or generations lose their right to education and employment opportunities. Thus, we decided that we had to take the struggle for democracy into a new arena. But this does not compromise our ideal to fight for democracy. Like Nelson Mandela, I agreed to work with a non-democratic regime as a transition to full democracy. June 11 marks four months since my swearing in as Prime Minister. I want to tell you that Zimbabwe is changing. Already Zimbabwe is a different place, a significantly different place and a better place. As a society, we were near death and we've come back to life. In our first 100 days, we provide first aid in a desperate situation, and we did four big things, real change that brought real results. First, 
we stopped the printing presses. The Zimbabwe dollar, the most inflated currency in the history of the world, is gone. The US dollar and the South African rand are effectively our national currencies. As a result, our record-setting inflation is also gone. Second, we stopped forcing the print media to be self-licensed. If I may paraphrase Thomas Jefferson, who said, a people with newspapers and no government are safer than people who have a government but no newspapers. Third, we have launched constitutional reform, which will lead to a people-driven constitution and free and fair elections. This was the promise of the National Constitutional Assembly, and it will just come to pass. Fourth, we took the riot police off the streets. Our capital city, Harare, is no longer a city under armed occupation. With those four steps, we have kept hope alive. Our schools, which almost were closed, are now mostly open. This year's backlog on marking exam papers has been cleared so children can receive their grades. <clears throat> some of our hospitals have some medication to treat some of the sick. Garbage is being removed from the streets in our cities and towns. Food aid is mostly available for 5 million people who need it. The basic necessities of ordinary life are present on our store shelves. All these are results of our specific policies, but also of the people's trust. The people have gone back to work because they trust that the struggle for democracy in the new arena will be successful, and that henceforth their government will be on their side. As the people gain hope and the change gains momentum, bigger and challenges, bigger challenges lie ahead. On, on June 1st, the movement of democratic change at its 10th annual convention formally appealed to SADC, the South African Development Community, to resolve the, gov the government deadlock over the Reserve Bank Governor and the Attorney General. Under the global political agreement, both of these positions were to be filled by consensus of all parties, and both incumbents were unilaterally reappointed. It is time that African leaders those who said the global political agreement was an African solution to an African problem, it is time for them to step up. The people of Southern Africa, led by their labor unions, the churches, and liberation heroes, have proved to friends of the people of Zimbabwe in their time of need. Their government leaders need to follow suit. I welcome the involvement of Af in Africa of President Barack Obama and his emphasis on rebuilding what you call America's soft power. The Reserve Bank of, Gambia, of Zimbabwe is the architect of the worst inflation in the history of the world. Our Reserve Bank has managed the economic policies that pushed at least 3 million refugees out of a population of 12 million to swim crocodile-infested rivers to escape one's uh, own happy land. We need to rectify the unprocedural appointment of the Reserve Bank Governor and the Attorney General. The office of the Attorney General has been so compromised that instead of dispensing justice to all fairly, we have witnessed selective application of the law. The African leaders who are guardians of the inclusive government uh, need to step forward now and tell President Mugabe and uh, the others that they must certainly consider leaving the political space. As I'm here in Washington, D.C., I also need to address the application of the global political agreement on the question of restrictive measures against officials of our government. The GAPA calls for all parties in Zimbabwe to work for an end to these restrictions. I am committed to the implementation of the GPA and the restoration of the rule of law. Those in our government who are personally listed should join me in that stand. When they do, world support for the removal of all restrictions will be unstoppable. Now, let's look ahead. Zimbabwe, over the last decade, can serve for many years as a bad example. A government that refuses to be accountable to the people can implement policies that bankrupt a nation. I look forward to Zimbabwe serving as a good example. And our short-term emergency recovery program, farmers are no longer required to sell their crops to the grain marketing board. No wonder we are producing only 20% of our food we needed. Our step also allows our mines to sell minerals at world prices. We should reverse the collapse of our mining sector. The plans of the previous government to nationalize the mines have been shelved. 
We will also change the policies that brought our manufacturing sector to operate at 10% capacity. In addition, we will again welcome the world at our airports. Tourism is 10% of our economy, yet we scared away tourists while preventing airlines from bringing them to our beautiful land. Finally, one of our greatest needs is the return of our talent. Sadly, many of those who first fled from the previous government were those whose language proficiency and educational attainment made them the most marketable in other countries. The brightest graduates of what was once the best school system in Africa. We need those people to come back home. They have an indispensable place in the new Zimbabwe. Let me reiterate once again that democratization is the first plank of our economic recovery program. We will build Zimbabwe around democracy, free elections, freedom of speech and assembly, respect for property rights, and respect for the rule of law. The growth of prosperity that follows these policies will be slower than the collapse brought about by their absence. But just as inevitable, each time I am amazed and challenged by America, amazed by what free people blessed by rich resources can do, and challenged by the knowledge that Zimbabwe, also blessed by rich resources and burning with the desire to be free, can do what you have done here. As America has been a beacon of hope for the world, Zimbabwe can be an engine of progress and democracy that transforms the African continent. Thank you. Thank you, America, for having kept the hope alive. Join me in our people's move forward together. I thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, a lot of food for thought there. Let me begin by picking up on something you said, which is that Zimbabwe is a different place. And certainly from what we've read and heard, economic reform is proceeding apace. But on the question of democratic and human rights, the, the reports are more troubling, whether it's the seizure of white-owned land is continuing or harassment and jailing of opposition figures and the media. Is the Mugabe regime or those people who are supporters of President Mugabe in the government, do they still constitute an author authoritarian regime that has the power essentially to muzzle dissent? Well, thank you, Margaret. I can understand sometimes the reservations around and the frustration that is sometimes expressed on the question of uh, democratic reforms. I want to first of all say that this is not a ZANU-PF government. This is not an MDC government. This is a new political dispensation constituted by these coalition partners. It is an agreement worked out out of a long, frustrating, and protracted negotiations. And therefore, when you judge this government, uh, it must be based on what this government has done including the question of political detainees, economic reform. As I speak, there is no one in detention at the moment. But of course, there was a time when people were unlawfully not given bail. And we have worked it through because, remember, this is a coalition. Sometimes you need to manage the political sensitivities around these kind of actions. And that's what we have done. Uh, I'm hopeful that uh, those remaining issues that continue to be the concern of the international community will be issues that we will be able to manage, and we know the challenges. Now, what the members of some members of Congress and the State Department are saying publicly is they wish you well in that endeavor, but that until there's actual progress made on the democratic reform side, they can't see their way clear to providing any kind of direct aid. Are they completely wrong-headed in that view? Or, in fact, is there a reason for the West to continue to withhold that kind of aid and, and to help force the, you know, the Mugabe forces, essentially, in the government to <coughs> do 
give ground on this democratic front as well as on the economic front? I think that uh, some of the uh, misgivings arise out of history. And I can understand that. As I said, is there any position we can take which says until one or two thing, three things are done, we will not move? I think it will be a wrong premise because what you must understand is that this unity government is an irreversible process towards the democratic objective. It is a transition to the democratic goal. So therefore, I think there has to be a measured, uh, targeted, and phased support, also measuring the progress that we are making towards achieving those kind of benchmarks. And remember that uh, those benchmarks are not something that, is, that are imposed from outside. We ourselves, 80% of the global political agreement is about democratization. And therefore, we ourselves want Zimbabweans to be free, and we are working towards removing the yesteryear repressive conditions that characterize the, our political dispensation. So we are moving into a new phase, and that's what needs to be rewarded rather than punished. But when you say we, you're talking about yourself and people, like-minded people. Do you have the authority in the government to push progress on these fronts? Oh, yes. The, the authority is there. Remember that in the global political agreement, executive authority is vested into three pillars. Instead of being in pre president and cabinet, it is president, prime minister, and cabinet. So it's a three-legged executive authority. So we discuss these things. But you must understand that sometimes you discuss issues and you disagree because the pace and the way you want things done. But it doesn't mean necessarily that you cannot revisit the issues because it is not insurmountable for us to discuss the issues for the good of the nation. After all, that's what brought us together. Uh, previously, we were people steamed in acrimony and uh, polarization. We have moved from that. So if the national agenda is to democratize, is to stabilize the economy, then therefore all of us are committed to see this country move forward. It means that we have to cut some of our practices and our mindsets of the past. And how persuaded are you that your former opponents feel that way? I can only judge by the way we have interacted. Uh, remember that trust is something that is built over time. You cannot just wake up one morning and start trusting your sworn enemy or your sworn opponent. But it takes time. And uh, to me, it has been instructive to the extent to which we have interacted between President Mugabe and the Prime Minister Twangra. Uh, we meet every Monday in preparation for our cabinet discussions. I give the report on how government is performing. And where we have a difficult, we try by all means to find what is the solution. Well, if anything is to go by, I'm not the one to stand and make a judgment. Perhaps others in government will have to make that judgment, not me. But as far as I'm concerned, things will begin to have workable solutions, to find solutions to the problems that people are facing. Remember that we are not there for the sake of Mugabe or Changra. We are there to serve the people of Zimbabwe. And as long as we are all motivated by the objectives of the global political agreement to serve the people of Zimbabwe, I will always do everything and work with anyone for the national interest. Since you're talking about motivations, what you said in your speech that <coughs> you, well, you think you're good at reading character, uh, what is your reading of President Mugabe? What is driving him now? Well, I'm sure that I don't want to demean those who have the misfortune of being over 85. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I can assure you that um, what probably motivates uh, people on that age group is the legacy. And I can only de deduce the fact that uh, perhaps it's about what is the legacy. And you know President Mugabe has gone through this CISO experience. And I'm sure at his late, uh, on his uh, twilight years, he has realized that he has to end his life as the founding father of the nation, not somebody who is a villain of the nation. Has he ever said that to you? Well, I don't want to reveal some of our own personal exchanges, some of them which border on, 
on uh, trying to establish some, some chemistry between us. Uh, because it has been a long time since we have ever sat across the table together. Uh, it's 10 years since we last sat together. Uh, and as I said, you know, it is quite an experience to work with somebody we have been fighting for the last 10 years. And who's had you jailed and beaten? Yes. Uh, well, I was almost killed. I know that. But you know what? If Nelson Mandela can go to jail for 27 years and is humiliated, is beaten, is doing all those things, I'm sure that uh, it is not a small measure for us to be inspired by that example. That even when you have uh, uh, your personal rivalries, there is always something called national interest. And that you always put the people first. And I'm sure uh, we, can, we can easily forgive but not forget what has happened. So in the meantime, what is wrong with the international community just keeping up the way it gives aid now, which is humanitarian aid through humanitarian agencies? Some governments even say, well, we'll pay the teachers directly or whatever, but they don't want to funnel the money through the government. Yes, there may be those uh, that, that reluctance to pass on that support directly to government. But I can assure you, that uh, there are mechanisms. We have just agreed in cabinet on a aid coordination architecture, which will allow the coordination between the government and the aid uh, and our donors to sit together, set the priorities, set the mechanism of delivery, and also the mechanism of accountability. So those who are reluctant because they are not sure how the money is going to be used or whether it is going to benefit the people of Zimbabwe, must be reassured by this kind of an arrangement. And besides, it is not just the question of humanitarian aid at the moment. I think we need to move further and say Zimbabwe is a potentially vibrant economy. Is there something that we can do in the interim to allow Zimbabwe, Zimbabwean industry to increase from 10% capacity to 60% capacity, our mines, our agriculture, and our industry to grow? then we don't become a perpetual burden to the international community. We'll be on our own. Can you do that with the aid structure that exists now, which is that it... No, it's insufficient. What you need is to move away from the humanitarian support, which is largely to deal with the food, health, uh, baby education. But what we need are lines of credit to our businesses, uh, some injection into the recovery budget so that the government is able to execute those priority programs that directly benefit Zimbabwe. So what will you consider a success when you leave Washington? What are you really looking for? Firstly, I think that uh, what is important is to have an understanding. We move away from the skeptical position to a position where there is an understanding that what is happening in Zimbabwe is an irreversible process towards change and towards transition. I think that is a very critical element. To me, that will be a fundamental understanding. Uh, secondly, I think that, yes, uh, I don't have to hide it. I think it will be important for the United States to give transitional support to the government, but for the sake of helping this government to survive. Because the alternative uh, is too ghastly to contemplate. If this government were to collapse because it has failed to raise sufficient resources then the danger is that what is there to replace it and what will be the future of Zimbabwe. To me, that is very, very critical. Right, well, we're now going to open up the floor to questions and invite the audience to join the discussion. And um, I think you, again, all know the ground rules here, but please wait for the microphone and speak directly into it. And just briefly state your name and your affiliation. And, um, I've been asked to ask you to be as crisp as you can just to give more time for questions and answers. So who would like to ask the first? Uh, well, there's right that back there in the back. Desmond Butler. Desmond Butler with the Associated Press. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, one of your fellow ministers has said that the government has drawn up an assassination list. How do, you, how do you work with a government like that? And is it in Zimbabwe's national interest for Mr. Mugabe to continue? Well, let me answer the first one, which is uh, 
the government has drawn up an assassination list. If there is anyone who would be afraid of being assassinated, it's me. Uh, so I don't think that uh, there is any such an assassination list. Uh, it may be some paranoia about what the government used to do, uh, and therefore it's a perpetuation of that kind of mindset. Uh, I'm sure that uh, there is no such threat, uh, and I can assure you that if you come to Zimbabwe, you will see that difference, and the confidence of the people demonstrate that. Now, on the second part, um, if it was my wish, uh, 10, 20 years ago, President Mugabe would have retired from politics in Zimbabwe. But he is a political reality in our situation. We have entered into an agreement with President Mugabe. Let's work through until such time that uh, the electoral process will be the only basis upon which the people of Zimbabwe will decide whether he will have any role or any role at all. Next, right, right here. Pauline Baker with the Fund for Peace. Um, Mr. Prime Minister, could you explain to us who is in control of the security forces in Zimbabwe, both the army and the police? The police ministry, I understand, is a joint ministry. That raises the question of who gives orders, how does the chain of command work? Uh, you referred in your comments about getting the riot police off the streets, but suppose there is a, is a crisis uh, and it involves your followers. Uh, you don't want the police to intervene. Um, do you have the authority to stop a, a situation like that, or could you be overruled by the Mugabe government? And, and please comment on the <coughs> army as well. Uh, in the past, uh, Margaret, uh, the experience has been that the institutions of the state, the police, the army, the CIO, has been responsible for a lot of abuses against Zimbabweans. We know that. But during the negotiations, these matters were tackled. How do we make sure that these organs of state are not partisan, are not abused by any political party, and that they become professional state institutions that protect Zimbabwe? It's there in the agreement. How are we going to make sure that we turn these institutions in that idea? A training program, uh, a curricula has been achieved, the human rights training is going through the police force, through the army. Now, coming back to your question, who is in charge? The commander of the army, the commander of the defense forces is the president of the country. In this case, is President Mugabe. But we have a structure that we have built up in the ground, which is called the National Security Council. In the National Security Council, it is jointly administered by president chairing that meeting, but all of us in the executive of government actually sit to give directives to the police, to the army. Now, it may appear as impractical, but that's the reality of our situation. And I want to tell you that uh, in the progress of time, I just want to make it clear that transformation is a process. You do not expect people who have been uh, uh, violent yesterday to wake up one morning and become peaceful. They still have the residual carryover of their baggage of yesterday. We know that. But what is important, if, if any experience is to be learned, is the Iraqi situation. If in the transformation of these institutions you get rid of all of them, or you threaten their existence, you actually create a threat for the stability of that, of that government. So we have learned that the best way is to educate, reassure, but make sure that during the course of time you actually build a professional institution. Right here, sir. How are you? My name is Travis Atkins. I'm with the International Foundation for Electoral Systems. And my question for the Prime Minister, obviously. Uh, I was struck by, I think, what I would call the contrast between the level of hope that you've shown and what I would call probably the extreme skepticism uh, of the Western world around the idea that Mugabe and his supporters would be willing to actually share power, would be willing to actually move towards change. So when you go on a three-week tour of Western governments, could you give us a sense of what is the core of your argument to us uh, that would cause us to believe 
that uh, someone who's shown such, such obstinance is really uh, worthy of our assistance and support. I appreciate your question, uh, which is one, it is a question of belief based on the past. Uh, my message is very, very simple. Zimbabwe's past should not be a, an example to anyone. And we all know the electoral violence, electoral abuse of human rights. We know that. But Zimbabwe has moved to a new political dispensation. <clears throat> but that dispensation is based on a transitional process of transformation to a democratic Zimbabwe. We have not given up our fight for a democratic Zimbabwe. Even when we share power with somebody who we believe has never been democratic, my assurance is that it is a process. We are going through stages of transformation. And down the line, we will have a free and fair election, which will give Zimbabweans an opportunity to choose their own government. And that, to me, is better than the experience everywhere, elsewhere in Africa where conflicts are resolved by armed conflict and they remove from violence to violence, from conflict to conflict endlessly. And if there is an opportunity to work with President Mugabe in a situation of ensuring that this transformation is irreversible, I will do it. Because I know and I believe that down the line, the objective why we have struggled for the last 10 years for democratic change will be achieved through a free and fair election. In other words, we are creating conditions. We are setting the stage for creating an environment of political tolerance, of national healing, to ensure that prosperity and stability go hand in hand. Um, well, let me catch this lady here in the second row, and then we'll go to the back again or the middle. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. I'm Tina Stanton with Mitsubishi International. You mentioned briefly that one of the plans of the government is to expand manufacturing capacity from 10% to roughly 60. How does the government plan to prepare for such foreign investment in infrastructure projects that come with a leap like that? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that uh, one of the key strategies on stabilization is how to get back Zimbabwe as the second economy in the region. Now, there are various measures. One of the measures is, of course, to create the policy environment. We know where the restrictions are. And my, our Minister of Economic Planning will tell you that there are so many reviews that need to be put in place that are inhibitive for foreign direct investment. That's one. The second issue is that we have already said that uh, the government has no business to be in some of the activities and therefore allow, create conditions for private-public partnerships and private investment in infrastructure rehabilitation. To me, that is the direction to take. As far as industry is concerned, uh, it is already suffering from being uncompetitive uh, because of the, of, the, of the competitive nature of progress, technological progress that South Africa and other manufacturers have increased. So we need actually a period in which we will have probably have to ensure that they are able to recapitalize uh, uh, their industries and they start producing again uh, as, as, as we have been. Um, right here in about the seventh row back on the aisle. <coughs> Hi, Mr. Prime Minister. Elizabeth Dickinson with Foreign Policy Magazine. Um, you've spoken with so much hope and I'm really struck by your optimism. Um, I want to ask you what keeps you up at night. What are the things that you think could, could monopolize or could, that could threaten the success of this government? Uh, and could, what are the things that you still remain on your mind as a concern? Well, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how I can articulate my whole night's <laughs> 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 process of thinking. <laughs> but let me say that. Um, what gives me optimism is that uh, is the hope that we have created in the people of Zimbabwe. When I go out to talk, uh, you know, I went to my village and I met a woman who said, Prime Minister, we want to only do two things. Get our education working, get our health delivery working. 
you have succeeded. So to me, it's a very easy task. The education is working. The health is working. Now, of course, there are higher complex issues that we have to deal with of governance. Uh, and, and, and of course, I have my worries. I have my worries when we think that things are moving smoothly. All of a sudden, something pops up. Uh, somebody's arrested. Uh, a journalist has been arrested. And it becomes the news. The negative becomes the news. And the positive is then ignored in the process. And that is my worry. Uh, I'm also worried, like all of you, we have expressed very serious mistrust on President Mugabe's commitment to this process. I still have my own corner of my mind, which says, maybe he's trying to cheat me. I have to be on my guard. But certainly, I have to, be, I have to always look hopeful, because that's what people expect. And uh, the people of Zimbabwe, uh, to me, are cautiously optimistic that we are on the right path. And I want to tell you that uh, over the last three months, we have been paying people $100 a month allowance. It's not a salary, but the people are patient. They believe that given the time, we are on the right course, and that given the time, we may actually move away from the allowance regime to a salary regime. And in due course, we'll be able to do so. And I think that builds the confidence. Yes, right here, sir, also on the aisle. Uh, Prime Minister Rob Quartel, Freight Desk Technologies. Uh, Zimbabwe used to be known as the breadbasket of Africa, and we here watch, have watched over the years the destruction of the farm system and the use of the, system, the farms as a reward for Mugabe. What are you doing to reform that? Uh, ten years ago, uh, when the, the, farm, the land reform program was instituted in a haphazard way, we took we took a step. We took a stand that the method was wrong. Uh, yes, land is an emotive issue, but it is also an economic asset. And the way you handle it guarantees your food production and food security, or you destroy your capacity to feed yourself. And this is what has happened. Now, what we have recognized is that even ZANU-PF recognized that the method used was wrong and that we need to rectify it. And these are the steps that we are taking. Firstly, is to make sure that we have a land audit which determines who owns what. But we already have policies that certain, certain sectors of agriculture must not be touched. The agro-industry, your citrus, your plantations, your, your sugar estates must not be touched. And then the next step is that once you have got an audit, you are then able to see a land reform program a rationalization program which gives people titles because it is also the security of tenure which is very important. It is not just the ownership of land. It is the security of tenure and the financing of that that is going to increase production in the country. So we are working on that. The second thing is that we have to put in a land commission which is independent to fulfill those objectives of increasing agricultural productivity. Because at the end, our farmers, some of them have not been trained. It is the responsibility of the commission to train, to invest in land production so that we can again restore our, our place as a breadbasket. And right next to the gentleman who just asked a question. Right in the front. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, Gwendolyn Michael, Georgetown University. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, um, I'm wondering about that um, broader Zimbabwe that is outside your borders. Uh, over the last few years, we've seen uh, a tremendous push into the surrounding countries. And I'm wondering what kind of thinking is going on now about um, the bringing the overtures to that population, the bringing back of that population, but also the regional relationships that have been impacted by that movement. Could you address that for me? Thank you. Thank you. Um, your question about Zimbabweans in diaspora is a real preoccupying issue. Firstly, it is about brain dead. The best, as I stated, the best brains have left the country because they are marketable in the region, they are marketable elsewhere. The second is that some, the majority of whom are actually economic refugees because of the dire state of our economy back home. 
Now, in dealing with those two, firstly, I think it is important to have a national scheme that is going to attract Zimbabweans uh, who are outside, uh, who want to come back and make a contribution. We will encourage that, and I think government is working already at a scheme that is going to attract Zimbabweans. Like any country which has this massive exodus of people, I think it is time we have a reverse, and that scheme will be encouraged. As for general economic refugees, the situation is not going to improve until there is positive growth in the country. And positive growth is a chicken in the egg situation. Uh, at what point do you say things are okay? I think it is also the progressive incremental development that takes place within the economy that will make sure that it stems the tide of people leaving the country because they now have uh, some source of income. And then secondly, uh, people looking forward to finding a job, of course, allowing government to create those conditions for job creation. I guess back in the third from the last row there. Yes, go right ahead. Oh. I'm Ellie Larson from the Solidarity Center. Mr. Prime Minister, welcome to Thank America. You. It's nice to see you here again. Um, a new constitution is a priority for the people of Zimbabwe, and toward that end, I understand that the chairpersons for the Parliamentary Select Committee have been appointed, but they are both members of the House of Assembly. A number of civil society organizations, including the ZCTU, the Zimbabwean Congress of Trade Unions, have objected to that because they would like to see an independent voice be part of the leadership of that committee. Can you comment on how you believe this will affect the process and what you believe the outcome will be toward a new constitution? Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, the issue of a national constitution is of a strategic importance to all the democratic forces in the country. Um, I understand the reservations expressed by some of the civil society organizations. But the negotiators agreed that the process of instituting the constitutional making process should be through parliament. And you will agree with me. That is not the first experience of the parliament taking a leading role in coordinating, not in inputting the substance, but in coordinating the process. The South African example is that it is the National Assembly which actually spearheaded and coordinated the constitution-making process in the country. We are almost following the same line. But however, what we have said is that uh, the first thing to determine the people-driven qualification uh, is that the stakeholders conference, which is going to be held by July 13, will be chaired by an independent person. We all agreed because it doesn't have to be a member of parliament. It is only the thematic committees that are emerging from that conference that will have the majority of civic society participating in the process and allowing for people to solicit the views of Zimbabweans. I think the limitation will be, it's not about the chairman, it's about what the people will say that is fundamental. And I have engaged with our civic society partners that your emphasis on the process, it's well understood. But remember that at the end of the day is the substance and how many people, how people are allowed to make an input and to be able to be part of that constitutional making process. And I'm sure there are no limitations as to how people will be involved. And I think that is the more important focus. Uh, yes, way in the back with the holding the piece of paper. I'm sorry, I can't see people's faces. I try to call on you by name. Hi, I'm James Kirchick with the New Republic magazine. Um, over the past nine years, the South African government has deferred uh, to the wishes of President Mugabe and his political party. And I'm curious as to whether you think the change in government there will lead to a more um, non-biased, non-partisan uh, approach from the South African government in terms of the inevitable um, conflicts that may arise in Zimbabwe over the next couple months and years. The role of South Africa is very important to the future of Zimbabwe. Yes, there could have been impressions created that it was biased towards uh, President Mugabe and Zanpia. But the negotiations have been concluded. 
we now have an agreement. And that agreement has been endorsed by SADAC, of which South Africa is the chair. So South Africa cannot get out of the process of endorsing that agreement and guaranteeing that agreement. And I think that's the role it will continue to play. Uh, I don't want to go to personal choices and personal preferences. I know that South Africa is important politically and economically for Zimbabwe. And I hope that President Zuma will continue the policy of ensuring that this agreement is observed and that Zimbabwe continues to make progress uh, towards a more democratic future. If you are calling on that group that's headed by South Africa to actually give Mugabe an ultimatum about getting rid of the Attorney General and the head of the Central Bank? We are calling on SADAC to intervene on that process because they are the guarantors of the agreement. All we are saying is that uh, President Mugabe has appointed these two positions unprocedural and that therefore as guarantors of the agreement they must come and adjudicate over that dispute. And how can they do that? Well, they will call a meeting and then we will raise the concerns we have got. And we go to the agreement. What SADAC itself has resolved is there on paper. And all we are trying to say is that let's rectify this procedural anomaly. With outside pressure? There has to be pressure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. This gentleman here. <coughs> uh, Carl Gershman from the National Endowment for Democracy. I want to follow up on your statement before that we must forgive but not forget. Could you outline what you think the transitional justice process will be in Zimbabwe and whether there will be or will there be not, not be impunity for people who've committed serious crimes? What we have said is that uh, as a government, uh, the culture of entitlement, the culture of impunity is an issue of the past. We cannot continue to observe the freedoms of the people when this culture uh, persists. So as a result, we have created this organ, uh, which is a three ministerial organ, dealing with national healing, dealing with reconciliation and integration. Now, they are the group that are supposed to define the process of dealing with transitional justice. Uh, what is going to happen to the victims of political violence? What's going to happen to the perpetrators of political violence? To me, when they are able to come with some form of agreement and healing between the two groups, I think we would have made much progress. But certainly we are not going to sweep everything under, uh, anything under the carpet because you are not going to heal by imposition. You are, can only heal by ensuring that truth is told, that there is forgiveness on the part of the individuals. If there is restorative justice that needs to be put in place, so be it. But I am not going to define how that healing is going to take place because it is within the responsibility and the role of this organ that we have set up. Uh, yes, the woman in the back, third row from the front, I think, from the back, I mean. Holly Wise, Georgetown University. Thank you so much for your commitment and your courage and for giving us hope. Um, my extended family used to have a beautiful and productive farm in Zimbabwe, and so permit me please to ask a personal question. Um, I don't like cholera, and I don't like carjackings, and I do like food, and I do like petrol uh, to be able to move about. So should I bring the children for Christmas? Uh, or more generally, what are you doing to promote and, and safeguard tourism as you uh, rebuild the country? Well, under those circumstances, I've got a minister of tourism here who is a very uh, champion, a very good champion of... First of all, I'm, you are most welcome to Zimbabwe. You will find the difference. And, and that's, why, that's why the travel warnings on Zimbabwe have been lifted. Uh, it's quite safe. Uh, it's quite healthy. Uh, and I can assure you that there will be no car hijack, hijacking. Uh, but if you are a bad driver, I cannot assure, guarantee you that you can't bump into a tree. Or a <laughs> <laughs> but uh, as for your safety to come and holiday in Zimbabwe, you're most welcome. And I'm sure that you will enjoy it. I was asked by a lady last night, um, this lady who is a presenter. She said, if I were to come to Zimbabwe, what is that that you can show me? And I thought, uh, and I thought, 
Maybe if I say Victoria Falls, it may interest her. <laughs> and indeed, uh, she said, yes, I know that. I said, you know, now that you have shown some, some reluctance to come to Victoria Falls, I'm going to show you the people of Zimbabwe. And she was very excited. And I think our people are something that we have to celebrate. Uh, they are peaceful people. I mean, who in the world would ever have imagined with all the violence that has taken place in the country that they have not resorted to armed conflict. They have remained peaceful. They have remained committed to the democratic ideals and to their vote. And I'm sure it is something that we need to celebrate. The gentleman standing in the back. Askia Mohammed with National Scene News Bureau. Mr. Prime Minister, I've been to your country on several occasions and I would echo your comments about peaceful people. Um, I noticed that people don't jaywalk, they obey the robots, as they're called, the traffic signals in, uh, in uh, Harare and other cities. In 1997, I traveled with Leon Sullivan on the African-African American su Summit. On that summit, Andrew Bremer, then a member of the Federal Reserve Board, said that your country had one of the strongest economies in Africa, and it was worthy of investment by people from this country. Also at that summit, there were demonstrations by members of ZANU-PF against your president because they said they had been betrayed on the promise of land reform, the, which suggests to me before the land reform movement began that there are sincere concerns on the part of those who fought and bled and died that they have some land. Is that process going to end? Will the people who uh, are promised and want land really fairly be distributed land, or has that come to an end? I think, as I, I said earlier, that land reform is a very emotive issue. But let me tell you, across the political divide, there is a national convergence on the need for land. There's never been any dispute across the political divide for the land reform to be distributed fairly, not based on race or color, but based on equity, transparency, and to allow those who want to use land productively to do so. That still remains. The divergence arose out of the method. Uh, the violent nature, the disruptive nature, the uncoordinated nature, and the biased nature of that land distribution. And the elitism that sometimes resulted from that land distribution that it is not the people who were landless that benefited from the land reform. It is the elite that benefited from the land reform. And I think those are matters that we are trying to rationalize and rectify. We have learned from our history that uh, you cannot cut your nose to spite your face. Uh, in fact, you, sometimes it's very, very dangerous that when you think you are taking from Paul to give Peter, you end up, both of them, being losers. And I think it's very important to learning a lesson. And we have gone through that trough. And, uh, and, and I'm sure that we will have a much more reasoned and a much more rational way of dealing with the land reform once and for all. Uh, right here on the aisle. And if I could just ask everyone to be fairly crisp in their questions, because we only have a couple, few minutes left. Thank you so much, Mr. Prime Minister. Camille Caesar from the Commerce Department. I'd like to ask you if there are specific investor protections that those in the foreign investment community have said to your government they need to see in place before capital can flow again to your economy in the way that you see very so much need right now. Thank you. Yes, I think that there are bilateral agreements uh, uh, that have been signed uh, for the United States is called what? Overseas Protection Investment. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Insurance. OPEC insurance. And I think that Zimbabwe and the United States have signed that. With other countries, bilateral agreements on the farms, there are BIPA farms, bilateral protection agencies for various farms. So, yes, there is that. Unfortunately, what we need to do is actually to enforce those agreements. It's one thing to sign an agreement, it's another thing to enforce it. And I think that's where the confidence comes in. And I'm hoping that the various ministers responsible for enforcement of those bilateral actually builds the confidence across the, across the, between, the, between the countries rather than undermine it. Uh, yes, and the gentleman right next to the lady that just asked a question. Uh, 
Dan McKelly, Council on Foreign Relations. I'm wondering about uh, some of Zimbabwe's other relationships with other countries besides the United States. We've talked about the relationship between Zimbabwe and the US. I'm wondering, I think in particular about the United Kingdom, which has an important historical relationship with, with Zimbabwe, and also about China, which uh, was quite close to President Mugabe and provided him with a great deal of assistance in, in recent years. We have to redefine our relationship with other countries based on the mutual interests of both countries. And I think that our foreign policy must be designed to promote Zimbabwe's best interests. To me, that is the, the bottom line. Um, there are more countries whom we can do relations better than others, but generally we cannot be selective. We cannot discriminate against any country. Uh, for the UK, yes, uh, for historical reasons, colonial reasons, we have a cultural and linguistic linkage to the UK. And sometimes when we make a dispute, it becomes so acrimonious because of that past relationship. <laughs> and one understands sometimes the acrimony is based on that uh, past history. Uh, but we are moving. Uh, when I go to UK, I'm going to see uh, Prime Minister Brown, uh, in spite of his present circumstances. <laughs> but he's Prime Minister of UK, and I'm hoping that we can, <laughs> we can build something uh, to restore again the relationship between Zimbabwe and the UK. Uh, as for China, uh, I can only say that uh, I don't think that it was necessarily a personal relationship. Uh, I think uh, China in Africa is playing a very significant role uh, across the uh, many countries. Uh, and I think it is on that basis that uh, uh, Zimbabwe and China develop those relations. Uh, I'm hoping that we can strengthen uh, even further. Uh, because I think uh, what we are looking at is the mutual benefit to both countries. This has to be the last question, very brief question, and I want to remind everyone this has been on the record, and then if you all could stay in your seats after the Prime Minister leaves. Uh, is there someone close to a microphone right here? All right, the young man way in the back. Thank you, thank you Prime Minister, for coming. My name is Bernard Sangan, the Zimbabwe Young Entrepreneurs Network. My question, you've been fighting President Mugabe for the past 10 years, and he's been clinching on power. What change do you see in Zimbabwe? And my other question is, we have millions of Zimbabwe in diaspora. What message do you have for them? Well, let me start, uh, Margaret, with the last one. I've already spoken on it. Uh, but I'm also addressing Zimbabweans on Saturday somewhere. Uh, I'm going to communicate the same message. Come back home. It's very simple. Uh, on the question of fighting, yes, I've already confirmed that uh, we were bitter rivals. Perhaps not personal enemies, but uh, bitter opponents over the last 10 years. I believe that Zimbabwe diverse, deserve, and in fact, that's why the liberation struggle was fought. It is to achieve the best democratic ideals for Zimbabweans. And we fought on that basis as a matter of principle, and I still believe that that is the principle we will continue to pursue. Uh, I want to assure you that uh, Zimbabwe is on the right course. Uh, it may not be there yet, but I want to tell you that as we move towards fulfilling the policies of the global political agreement and uh, transforming the institutions so that we have a more open society, Zimbabwe will be a better place for younger entrepreneurs like you. Prime Minister Morgan Changarai, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for watching this Council on Foreign Relations video. For additional audio, video, and transcripts of CFR meetings, as well as expert analysis of international news, please visit us online at CFR.org.